In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Yesterday we had the great, the great St. Albert the Great, and we know there are many man-saints who are called the Great, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Great, but today is the only woman of all the great female saints that's called the Great, and it's St. It's Gertrude. Why is she called the Great? It seems because she was so powerful in intercession and miracles and greatly loved. And from the very beginning, at age five, she already consecrated her whole heart to our Lord, her whole body and soul, by virginity of body and virginity of soul. So from a very tender age, she was already in love with our Lord. And he chose her like a like a chosen lily, a chosen rose, he had his eye on her and prepared her with many gifts. And in her life, of course, there's many miracles. There's a whole book called The Revolu Revelations and Miracles of St. Gertrude. And at one point, they had no priest for a long time. Wouldn't this be nice for many of our circuits, of our <coughs> mass missions? They had no priest. So St. Gertrude prayed to our Lord, Lord, help us. We have no priest to bring us you. So our Lord came and said Mass. And St. John served and St. Luke and the Apostles served the Mass and gave communion to the sisters. So wouldn't that be nice if <laughs> our missions who do suffer because of the shortage of resistance priests and travel. And now that the oratory is undergoing the formation of priests, it's not so easy to get away. So uh, we let's ask St. Gertrude for a miraculous solution to this difficulty. We know that all the priests of the society were trained by Archbishop Lefebvre. They were the crack troops of the church to fight against modernism and to study and know the subtle the subtle sophistries and the cunning ways the modernists work we were trained in this by archbishop lefebvre by studying the papal encyclicals studying the works uh, of against liberalism such as father dennis fay and in, in, this, in Spanish and in French, there's many other authors writing whole works uh, against liberalism. So for the society priests to trip into liberalism, it's a greater guilt, really. It's a greater crime, because we weren't supposed to. And of course, human nature is easily falls, but, but God gave that grace to the society of St. Pius X priests. So there's no reason they should be following the subtle traps of liberalism, such as, well, we have to get in with Rome, otherwise we're going to be schismatic. Well, none of us want to be schismatic. We're all Catholic. We acknowledge the Pope is Pope. He's a bad Pope. We pray for him, and we resist him to the face. It's really that simple. There's no danger of being schismatic, Archbishop Lefebvre said, because we're just Catholic. But we must oppose the errors of these popes and modernist bishops all throughout the world. So <clears throat> that was another, that was one of the many fallacies. And another one was it's going to be too long if we go on this way without an agreement with Rome, then we're going to become a parallel church, and so forth and so forth. But as long as this crisis lasts in Rome, so as long as we got to resist it. And none of us asked for this, but God put us in these days to fight for him. So we need St. Gertrude's help to wake up some priests, many society priests who should, who know the right position. They know the resistance priests as few and flimsy and poor and weak and clay that these priests are, they know it's the right position. They know they've compromised. They know you can't call the new mass legitimately promulgated. They know that. 
They know you cannot promote new mass miracles and new mass gives grace because it's deceptive because that new mass is not just a liturgical question. It's a question of dogma and the faith because the new mass presents a new dogma on the priesthood, on Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist, on transubstantiation, on the sacrifice of the mass. These are dogmas of the faith, and the new mass directly attacks these. So all the priests of the society and bishops know better. They know you can't compromise with Vatican II. They know, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, even though not every sentence in the documents of Vatican II is heretical, in fact, you can argue there's some good sentences, but it's laced, it's weaved in through and through very cunningly with ambiguous terms and errors and double meaning phrases. As Father Schielebeck said, we sowed, deliberately sowed ambiguous phrases so that afterwards we can use them to destroy the church. And Father Hans Kung said Martin Luther left the church, but we're staying in this time. So we were trained in this by Archbishop Lefebvre because he, he was facing this eye to eye, <clears throat> fist, fist to fist, <clears throat> face to face with the modernists in Rome. And Archbishop Lefebvre would even say about Cardinal Ratzinger, he's a <laughs> slippery character, he's an eel, he's a serpent. In the French it's kind of more clear, very, he's a serpent, a very cunning serpent that has a, has a double tongue. And it was, it was Pope Benedict XVI, Cardinal Ratzinger, who seduced most traditional groups to compromise with Vatican II in the New Mass. Just give in a little bit. We'll let you have your Latin Mass. You can even preach against modernism. Isn't that wonderful? What a deal. But tone it down against the New Mass, preaching against the New Mass. Tone it down. But you have to start preaching, teaching Vatican II in your seminaries. But you have to accept that Vatican II enlightens tradition, and tradition enlightens Vatican II. All these subtle little traps. So all the priests of the society know better. They all, at least the older echelons, the older ranks, that while Archbishop Lefebvre was alive, and maybe the first ten years after his death, the society was strong by the grace of God. And even Bishop Fillet, even Bishop Fillet, he gently scolded Campos in 2003 for their compromise with modernist Rome. And he says, he told them, you can't compromise until Rome comes back to tradition. He used to hold that position. But then he somehow, I don't know how, God alone knows, he, he's now changed that position. And once you, once you start shaking hands with modernists, once you start playing with them and dialoguing, it's a deadly trap. And this is where we have to imitate Our Lady, who didn't dialogue with the devil. Eve did, and got us in trouble. You don't dialogue with the devil. You don't dialogue with communists or modernists. But to convert them, yeah, with charity and so forth, yes. So let's look at St. Gertrude's life. Let's pray to her to help us in this desperate situation of the crisis of the Church. Pope Francis continues to work his horrible destruction of the Church with these recent synods, trying to push for female deaconesses and female priests. That's their goal. Of course, that's like baptizing with Coca-Cola. It's invalid. It won't work. And, you know, women, our Lord loves women, and he chose one to be his own mother, and she surpasses all the angels and saints. She's the model for all women. But women can never be priests. It's just absolutely impossible. It's just impossible. But that's what they want. They want to twist, bend, evolve the Catholic faith, and they just can't. So we have to hold strong in the faith. And let's pray to St. Gertrude the Great to intercede for us, help us, bring us more priests, to, to snap out of this liberal trance and come and fight the way they were ordained to do so. 
The same with the bishops. And let's pray for all these bishops of tradition. You have the four, now, now minus one. Um, Bishop Tissier just died, as we know. Pray for him. But the three, they all know better. Bishop Alphonsus de Galareta, he was a, a, a great defender. In fact, in 2011, when Bishop Follet presented the doctrinal declaration for the first time, called the Preamble, in 2010 and 11, it was Bishop de Galareta who said, if we sign this, it'll bring confusion to the faithful, it'll bring division among the ranks of the society priests, it'll be a scandal, close this Pandora's box before you bring in destruction. That's what he said, and he knew he was right. But then in 2012, he said, as Father Chazal quoted him in the French, well, if that's the, the choice Bishop Follet wants, too bad, we have to follow it. So they all know better, and we got to pray for them to snap out of that liberal trance. That's what it is. It's a dangerous trance. And we got to also be aware of the fake resistance trance. It's very dangerous. And people think, well, it's their traditional, their SSPX, X, X, SSPX. So they know the fight. Their Archbishop Lefebvre ordained, or at least from the lineage. They, they all have studied against modernism, so we can trust them. But if, you're, if any of us are silent against the new Mass, silent against the errors of the new Mass, silent against Vatican II, and we start toning it down, that's given into the enemy. As Pope Pius VI said, one error in any diocese that's taught by any bishop or priest, any error doesn't attack just that parish or diocese. It attacks the whole universal Catholic Church. Pope Pius VI said this in the Actorum Fide. One error attacks the whole church. One splinter in your foot, you feel the pain in your whole body. The whole, pot, the whole body reacts. One attack of a bacteria or, or a virus, the whole body fights it. So it is, the whole church is affected by error. And bishops and priests have a duty to, to bark like dogs against any error and any compromise. And what's an interesting point we've been studying with the, 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 the first candidates of the seminary studying Octorum Fide of Pope Pius VI, who came right, at, right after the French Revolution and condemns the, he condemned the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is the whole basis for the modern world. It's a total revolution against Christ the King and putting man above God. And the most practical example is, you know, it's, it's my body, my rights. I can kill my baby. That's a perfect practical application of that horrible Freemasonic document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was condemned by Pope Pius VI. And this great pope also said, these, they weave their cunning terms and double phrases to work in sweetly, as it were, errors into the minds of the faithful. And that's how they deceive them, with subtle phrases. And he, he gets on the bishops. You have to preach against these errors. Pope Gregor XVI, he tells the bishops, raise your voice, shoot out, pull out these wolves out of the flock, pull out the weeds out of the, out of the garden of the church. And Pius X, same thing. Pope, Pope Pius IX in Leo the Thirteenth, they all muster the bishops. Do your duties to preach against heresy and error, and beware of subtle errors. And one of them, he says, it don't don't be one of those priests or bishops that teach about the Holy Eucharist and about the Mass, but but shy away, deliberately shy away from using the words that the Council of Trent has fixed to defend and define what the Mass is. So he was, he was condemning those priests and bishops who were teaching about the Mass and the Holy Eucharist without mentioning the key theological word, 
transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, which means the changing of the bread and wine into the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. To omit using that word, he says, it smacks of heresy, it's rash, it favors the her heretic, heretical teachings. So we have to use the, the great words the Mother Church has, has used to defend the Catholic faith, such as the word hypostatic union, the, the union of the, the divine person assuming the human nature. These are key words which have to be explained, but they are key words because they are precise and they are against error. They, they save souls from falling into heresy and error. And you might say, well, what's all this? Well, scoffers will say, what's all this argument about all these distinctions and definitions and dogma? Religion is about feeling. It's not about ideas. Well, no, it's both. Dogma, doctrines, we must believe. And we must love God, obviously. So we must have the right doctrine and the right definitions. Otherwise, we fall into error. And if you and I lose the faith, we cannot save our soul. That's the importance of the faith. Without the right faith, we can't get to heaven. And if we lose the faith, we, go, we will go to hell. It's serious. It's very serious, this business. It's the business of business, says St. Bernard, of saving our soul. And for the men especially, fighting for the true faith, fighting for the true religion, especially the bishops and the priests. So, again, let's pray to St. Gertrude to work her miracles to move priests to fight for tradition, really, without compromise. The adulterers, thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> we could add uh, the adultery, which is, it truly is an adultery of the faith. It's taken the real mass but marrying this precious gift of God with error and compromise with Vatican II and the new Mass. It's a truly a, a crime. It's an unspeakable crime. It's like taking the most precious gem given by God and throwing it in the mud, smearing it with mud and saying, isn't it a pretty gem? Oh, I want to look at the colors. But you smear it in mud. And Vatican II... It's not just, you know, some dusty old council in the 60s. It, today, right now, it is taking hundreds and hundreds of souls to hell and bringing many priests to lose the faith. And Pope Francis is doing all this destruction, what, in the name of Vatican II? And didn't Archbishop Lefebvre say that? They're destroying our catechism. They're destroying the priesthood, destroying the mass, destroying the church all in the name of reform, and all in the name of Vatican II. So we have the privilege to be alive now to stand up against this onslaught of, our, of the Bride of Christ. As that great Bishop Ezekiel, that anti-liberal bishop in, in Colombia in the 1800s, in the time of Pius X, said, he said, if uh, imagine a mother who is uh, surrounded by thugs, and they start beating her. And the son is in the living room, sitting, well, he didn't say this, but he's sitting there playing video games. And, he's, and he hears some scuffling going on in the next room, and he sees his mother being beaten, but sits there and go, goes on playing video games. Can you imagine the horror, this bishop says, that this, that this young man doesn't rise up and fight off these men beating up his mother? So it is, he says, we see Mother Church attacked by all these heresies and errors and betrayed by bishops and priests and her own. Who's going to rise up to defend our mother, Mother Church? And that's our duty now. We must defend Mother Church, the Holy Catholic Church of tradition, which is the Bride of Christ. It is the sheepfold. It is the garden enclosed. It is the, the field planted with weeds and wheat indeed. It is the wedding feast with uh, those dressed for the feast, but those not. And as St. Gregory the Great says about the gospel today, the church is, yes, made of holy good virgins, five 
prudent virgins and but five foolish. Because even in monasteries and convents, you can have worldliness, you can have laxity, you can have sin, and so forth. So in this world, in the church on earth, there's always going to be the weeds and the wheat. But God permits these things to try the good and make us better, and to be a warning to the wicked to avoid sin and straighten out before they die. So let's ask St. Gertrude the Great, live up to your powerful name, St. Gertrude. We call you great. So intercede with us. And we and here in England, you've had, over the past 10 years, you've had good priests come through. Father Ribas from Spain and Father Jacquemin. These were good priests. And Father Jacquemin was a great SSPX priest. And uh, who else? I mean, the list is quite a long list, but many of them fell into Sedevacantism, which is an easy thing to fall into today with the scandals of this Pope. And, and others fall into, well, we, a false obedience to Rome or a false compromise with the fake resistance or the new SSPX position. So it's, it's really a, it's a dangerous battle because you can fall to the right, to the left, forward, backward. It's, it's a grace of God if any of us even have the faith today. It really is. Archbishop Lefebvre even said, with a vocation, any vocation out of the modern world, and he said this in the 70s, <laughs> any vocation out of the modern world is a miracle of God's grace. And if that's the case for the 70s and 80s, all the more for now, when the world is far more corrupt, far more rebellious against God. But God raises up generous souls. So this is the time to give our life to God when we're young. Don't be one of those who say, well, I'll wait till I'm 40 or 50. Then I'll think about being a priest or a nun or a brother. Well, yeah, all right. And then you spent the best part of your life for yourself. And often, often in vice sin and revelry and so forth. But isn't it a far greater thing to give the flower of our youth to God, like St. Gertrude did? I mean, talk about the flower of youth. She was five when consecrating her whole life to Jesus Christ. St. Gertrude, born of a noble family at Asleben in Saxony, at the age of five in the Benedictine convent at Rodardsdorf consecrated herself and her virginity to Jesus Christ. From that time forth, she had, she led a sort of heavenly life, estranged from all earthly interest, and in earnest pursuit of virtue. To an acquaintance with human learning, she added a knowledge of divine matters. So yes, she was known, she, was, she had a sharp mind, this Gertrude. She had a very good sound mind for theology, philosophy, which is rare in women, but she had it. By meditating on these, she became so inflamed with the love of virtue that she soon attained Christian perfection. She spoke frequently, inspired by a holy understanding about Christ and the mysteries of his life. The one thought which guided all her desires, all her action, was the glory of God. So she, okay, she's in the 1200s. She's contemporary with St. Albert, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure. Um, just after St. Bernard, he would just, just would have died recently. So that's the era she was in. Although she was marvelously endowed by him with many choice gifts, both of nature and grace, she thought meanly, humbly of herself, and counted it one of the greatest miracles of divine goodness <laughs> that God should so mercifully bear with her great unworthiness. At 30 years of age, she was elected superior, first of the convent of Rordardsdorf, where she had made her first profession of religious life. Later, she became superior at Hef Helfta, an office she held for 40 years. She governed with such prudence, charity, and zeal for strict discipline that the convent seemed to be the home of religious perfection. In both convents, however, although she was mother and mistress of all, she wished to be considered the least of all. In her humility, she ranked herself as a servant. To serve God more freely, she afflicted her body with vigils, 
fasts, and other mortifications. In her own characteristic way, she showed rare innocence, meekness, and patience. She devoted herself by every means within her power to do good to her neighbors. Her pious efforts bore abundant fruit. By the favor of divine love, she often experienced ecstasies. She received as well the gift of a most sublime contemplation and union with God. So she saw the angels, she spoke with saints, she spoke with our Lord. But you know when saints are raised to that height, they also suffer very much. To show how much the merits of his beloved spouse pleased him, our Christ our Lord declared that the heart of Gertrude was a most acceptable dwelling place for him. So he would say, you will find me in the heart of Gertrude. With singular piety, she devoted herself to the Virgin Mother of God, whom she had received as her mother and guardian from Jesus himself. She received numberless favors from the Blessed Virgin. St. Gertrude was so moved by her intense love for our Lord in the most blessed sacrament and in his passion, that now and again in the gratitude of her soul she would weep copiously. She helped the souls of the just suffering in the expiatory flames of purgatory by daily sacrifice and prayers. She wrote many books to foster devotion. She was famous for her gifts of divine revelation and prophecy. She died in the year 1292, consumed at length by the ardor of her love for God rather than from any disease. She was singularly marked out by God through the miracles wrought at her intercession, both while she lived and after she had died. So let's ask the St. Gertrude that our hearts also be where our Lord can dwell and stay and be loved, be adored, and be defended. Often he allows us to undergo temptations against the devil, the world, the flesh, the disordered passions. He allows this because he wants us to fight to defend his presence in us by sanctifying grace. We have to fight for it and bleed for it and sweat for such a great trophy. To be united to God here on earth by sanctifying grace and to be united to him in Holy Communion and the sacrifice of the Mass and then finally to be united to him in the glory of heaven. Which joy I wish for all of you through the, through the powerful intercession of St. Gertrude the Great. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us that recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us that recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us that recourse to thee. For those who do not have recourse to thee, especially. All communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.